For our next special address, entitled Social Glue and the Collective Brain, we have with us Professor Harvey Whitehouse, Chair of Social Anthropology and Director of the Institute of Cognitive and Evolutionary Anthropology, ICEA, University of Oxford. To introduce him better, please welcome Muhammad Raslan Muhammad Sharif, Head of Corporate Communications, Kazana. Raslan, please. Over to you, Raslan. Thank you. Thank you, Shamira. Our next speaker, Professor Harvey Whitehouse, is Chair in Social Anthropology at the University of Oxford. Professor Whitehouse is one of the founders of the Cognitive Science of Religion field. He is especially well known for his theory of modes of religiosity that has been a subject of extensive critical evaluation and testing by anthropologists, historians, archaeologists, cognitive scientists, and evolutionary theorists. In recent years, Professor Whitehouse's work has expanded beyond religion to examine the roles and rituals of all kinds in binding groups together and motivating intergroup competition, including warfare. In the research paper, Brothers in Arms, Libyan Revolutionaries Born Like Family, Professor Whitehouse and his co-authors wrote that the human propensity to sacrifice one's life for genetic strangers has puzzled scientists since Darwin we found striking evidence of extraordinarily tight familial-like bonds among those who put themselves directly in harm's way. In fact, for nearly half of the combatants, their bonds to each other were stronger than the bonds to their own families. Moreover, these kin-like bonds to one another predisposed them to extreme self-sacrifice. Now, it's not all doom and gloom, Professor Whitehouse's work has also led to efforts that aim to harness the knowledge gained from his research towards practical applications that can help to defuse violence, tackle crime, and even save the planet, which he will share in his presentation today. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Professor Harvey Whitehouse. Well, thank you very much for that lovely introduction. Um, we're getting towards the end of the conference now, and uh, what a wonderful conference it's been. I've, I've really enjoyed this, and I'm tremendously grateful to Kazna for inviting me to be part of it, and to all of you for maintaining your levels of energy as we head towards the end of the proceedings. Um, the title of this uh, lecture is Social Glue and the Collective Brain. Um, I'm sure you all recognize this. This is the International Space Station. It's a wonderful example of the collective brain at work. It's also uh, a magnificent example of how collaboration across the sciences and uh, how technological innovation, uh, what it can produce. But it's also, and this is really important, it's also uh, an illustration of the human desire to cooperate to contribute to something greater than all of us as individuals. All the achievements, all the great achievements of human civilization, including those amazing temples that Ronnie just showed us in the region of the world that I now dare not call Southeast Asia, um, are, uh, all of these things are examples of a huge amount of social glue being applied in the world, and a huge amount of collaboration and coordination of human activity. Now, my research group at the University of Oxford has been studying these processes for many years, and I want to share with you some of our more significant and interesting findings. So let me take you on a journey, a journey that begins here in Papua New Guinea, which, as I'm sure you all know, lies to the north of Australia and to the east of Indonesia. Um, I worked some 30-plus years ago uh, on the island of New Britain here among a group of people deep in the rainforest who called themselves the Mali. The Mali were a group that had never been described by anthropologists who had a language that had never been written down. 
But locally, the Mali were famous for their spectacular fire dances, at which men would dress up in these amazing costumes and run into the fire, often sustaining uh, really nasty burns. Traditionally, you had to undergo really painful initiation rituals to have the right to wear masks like this. These tortures involved things like extraction of blood from the tongue using a sharpened leaf, insertion of sharpened cassowary bone into the skin at the base of the spine, and numerous other kinds of tortures. Now, one of the effects of going through very painful, emotionally intense rituals like that with a group of other uh, young men was that it bonded these groups together into extremely tight-knit units, units that would stand together in the face of enemy attack and that would be prepared to carry out daring raids against enemy groups. So the Mali were divided up into small warrior groups, very fierce, very bellicose, where the social brain scarcely extended beyond a small relational community. And when you encountered people from other groups, you generally, it was generally in a hostile and violent way. Now, prior to my arrival in the field, something very dramatic had happened to the social brain of the Mali people and their neighbors. This is the community I lived with for two years, uh, learning the language, learning about the culture, by going native myself, by becoming part of the group, learning uh, about things by basically joining in with everything that the community did, mucking in and forming part of everyday life alongside everyone else. This is something that we anthropologists call rather grandly participant observation. Now, I soon realized early on in this period of research that almost everyone in this community was a member of a new religious movement calling itself the Kivung, which means a meeting, or it can be used as a verb to meet. They're actually meeting here in this photograph. Now, the core idea of the Kivung was that the ancestors of the group would soon return from the dead, bringing with them all the amazing wonders of Western technology. They would flatten the rainforest and produce magically overnight a huge high-rise city, uh, buildings, high-rise buildings, the like of which people had only ever heard stories about. But before this astonishing miracle of the returning ancestors could occur, the villagers had to convince their dead relatives that now was the time for them to return, and to do that required the performance of a great variety of rituals. This is an example. Here, the men of the village form a solemn procession into a specially constructed temple where they will lay out offerings of food to the ancestors. Now, a striking thing about the Kivung is that it involved a huge number of these sorts of rituals that were performed on a daily or twice weekly or weekly basis, basically very frequent rituals. Rituals so frequent that everybody could notice if anybody stepped out of line and did it differently. And that made it possible to standardize a body of beliefs and practices across a really large area, encompassing hundreds of villages and tens of thousands of Kivung followers. Another remarkable feature about the Kivung is that the entrance to every village, you would see a post like this one on the left with the Roman numerals one to 10 inscribed upon it. This was a reference to the 10 commandments of the Old Testament which had been learned from visiting uh, Catholic missionaries in the area. And note that the sixth commandment explicitly forbids killing other people. So this is a, a clear instruction not to engage anymore in warfare. To the right, you see a map of East New Britain province with the Mali on the eastern sector, and you see lots of other languages in this region. All those groups were at war with each other, previously, and the Mali were at war often with many other Mali speakers in their own region. But under the Kivung, they were united under the umbrella of a shared tradition of rituals and beliefs and practices and a shared morality borrowed from the Catholic missionaries. In addition, all Kivung followers had a ritual to, that they had to perform whenever they sinned, whenever they uh, transgressed against the Ten Commandments. This ritual was very much like the Catholic confessional, but with a kind of twist. In addition to granting people absolution and a feeling of catharsis, performing this ritual entailed giving what money you had and placing it into a, a special receptacle 
which was then the property of the Kivung. Now, you can imagine that what this means is that over time, a huge collective fund began to build up as these tens of thousands of Kivung members committed more and more sins and paid more and more money into the collective pot. This enabled the Kivung to establish aid posts, providing vital medicines for common tropical illnesses. It allowed them to establish cash crops, like cocoa and coffee and copra. Uh, it provided uh, the funds, the wherewithal, to establish roads and to procure vehicles to take those cash crops to the market, uh, which, of course, generated more money to pay for more sins. And before you knew it, you had a sort of mini-state within a state. The Kivung took over the function, many of the functions of government, and although not constitutionally separate from Papua New Guinea, it formed something like a separate mini-state. Now note that no new technology was required for this expansion of the collective brain. What it did require as the two major catalysts were the establishment of more frequent collective rituals so that you could standardize the tradition across a wide area and an agreed upon moral system that everyone signed up to and that forbade violence. Now, this pattern that we've just observed in this small area of Papua New Guinea that occurred over a very short period of time has occurred many times in world history over much grander and longer timescales. And it's the reason for, or it's among the key reasons, the chief reasons, let's say, why we have uh, so many uh, large states that we all live in today. It's part of the reason why we can have such a thing as an international space station. But it also has a dark side to it. The growth in the collective brain through these sorts of processes means that we can also amass very large armies uh, and kill each other on uh, much larger scales than ever before. And note that unlike in the Kivung, in most of the world, these sorts of practices that involve very intense group bonding continue to persist in lots of small groups, including terrorist organizations where willingness to blow oneself up, to sacrifice oneself for the group, continues to, uh, to persist. So a question that I really want to address in this talk is, can we build a framework to understand these processes more deeply and manage them in the world we live in today? So let me begin by telling you the framework that we've been building in Oxford. This framework envisages broadly two quite different kinds of collective brain. One of these we call imagistic, and it, it, it sort of corresponds to these sort of very intense uh, initiation rituals that the Mali had before the Kivung spread to the region. And the other we call doctrinal, which is more like the big mainstream Kivung movement. So let me run through some of the key features here. Imagistic rituals are low in frequency. They're rarely performed. Often they're once in a lifetime experiencing, experiences and they're very intense emotionally. So we call them low-frequency, high-arousal rituals. People remember those kinds of rituals for many years to come. They stick in people's minds, and they prompt a lot of reflection on their meaning. Those sorts of experiences that are remembered and reflected upon form a central part of the personal self, your core identity. And when you share experiences like that with others, it produces intensely strong social bonds in a group. But this kind of very intense social cohesion is difficult to spread to larger social groups. Its main function socially is that it provides a way of ensuring that people will stand together in the face of uh, threats that are very severe. For example, in situations of warfare and when hunting very big and dangerous animals that might want to eat you. By contrast, the doctrinal mode is based on very frequently performed rituals. This makes it incredibly easy to spot when anybody deviates from the standard uh, system of practices and beliefs, and it makes it possible to, to establish an authoritative, standardized body of doctrines or an orthodoxy. It also makes it easy to spread, because if you codify your beliefs and practices into a set of highly frequent uh, things that can be repeated by a bunch of orators, you just need a handful of proselytizing individuals, and you can spread the tradition to really large populations. This, in turn, 
produces what one historian has called imagined communities. Communities too big for you to possibly know every other member of them personally. It produces social cohesion, sure, but not with the same intensity as the imagistic kind of practices that I was describing, but it has a special advantage that they lack. It allows you to collect small amounts of commitment in the form of resources like taxes and tribute from a very large population, which when centralized, amounts to a really large and valuable pot of, of resources. Now the question that struck us many years ago was this is all very well, we've got examples of this from Papua New Guinea and from many other regions of the world, but they were case studies. Uh, what we wanted was a more objective way that, uh, of, of assessing the generalizability of this model. Does it apply to lots of other parts of the world? And to go for a way of answering that question that wasn't too vulnerable to selection bias, we constructed a large database of rituals from around the world. We constructed it built out of material uh, extracted from a huge resource of ethnographic writings, a storehouse of ethnography known as the Human Relations Area Files. And from that, we extracted information on 644 rituals from 74 cultural groups from around the world selected to maximize di diversity. And for each of the rituals in the database, we collected information about roughly 100 variables that were relevant to this theory about imagistic and doctrinal practices. So that included lots of information about things like emotional arousal, performance frequency, scale, and, and, and sort of uh, the size of groups, that kind of thing. Here's an example of some of the data. We found a negative correlation between performance frequency of rituals and emotional intensity. That was as predicted. Actually, we also found a very clear bunching of rituals about around both ends of that. So we found that you know, the, if you have a rarely performed ritual, so most rarely performed rituals are going to be high in emotional intensity, and there's a real clustering of them around that end of the spectrum, whereas a, also a real clustering of rituals around the high frequency, low arousal end. But we also discovered things that we weren't expecting to find, and one of the most powerful discoveries that really changed our thinking in a, in a deep way was that as rituals increase in frequency, so too does the agricultural intensity of the societies they occur in. In other words, the more dependent you are on farming, the more likely you are to have high, uh, high frequency, highly repetitive rituals. Now this suggests that there's some kind of interesting relationship between uh, the rise of agriculture and the rise of these doctrinal practices that I've been describing. Is it possible that the development of the first really large civilizations, along with the emergence of agriculture, was at least partly driven by the rise of more frequent rituals? To answer that question, we went here to one of the most rich archaeological uh, um, sites in what is now central Anatolia in modern Turkey, known as Çatalhöyük. Some seven to 9,000 years ago, a huge civilization flourished at this site, one of the world's very first cities. It was a place in the world where hunter-gatherers were gradually turning into farmers for the very first time. We see the first evidence of crop cultivation and of animal domestication. And as agriculture is intensifying over the couple of thousand years of settlement, we see that at the same time, the frequency of collective rituals is increasing. We see that a regional tradition is becoming established and homogenizing. We see the first evidence of the emergence of social differentiation. And just as this is happening, we see a decline in imagistic rituals and in the small cohesive groups that they bond together. This was exciting, right? And it took a lot of years to build up this picture, but it's still only one site in one little part of the transition from foraging to farming that changed the world. So we needed to see whether there was a more general uh, pattern in the region. So we looked at, these are just some examples, a whole host of new archeological sites covering not just Anatolia, but stretching deep into the Levant, uh, 60 sites in total, 
And to cut a very long story short, this was the main finding. If you look at the, uh, if you read it from the bottom up, the Epipaleolithic is 10 plus thousand years ago. And as you work upwards through this diagram, you're heading into more uh, recent times, up to the pottery Neolithic, when farming is fully established. The blue on this represents imagistic evidence for predominantly imagistic traditions, whereas the red represents predominantly doctrinal ones. And what we're seeing is a gradual transformation as agriculture takes root, as societies get bigger and, more, and as the collective brain becomes larger. We're seeing this transition from imagistic to doctrinal rituals. Now, this was also exciting, but it had its limitations too. This was only a regional uh, database, and it only covered the very early phases of farming, plus there were lots of gaps in the data. So what we then did was do something way more ambitious, probably the most ambitious thing uh, I've been involved in in my career, is that we built a global history data bank called Seishat, named after the uh, ancient Egyptian goddess of writing. The advantages of this is that, of course, it's global, as the name implies. It's not just regional. And it covers a massive period of human history, 10,000 years in total. The core variables in this database include social complexity. That's important. That's our outcome variable for many of the theories we're going to be looking at. Warfare, ritual and religion, of course, and agriculture. So we needed a good measure of our uh, dependent variable, social complexity. How did we do that? Well, we asked ourselves, how have people understood social complexity across the literature in the social sciences and related disciplines? And we found 51 clusters of variables that people linked to social complexity. And we said, we're going to try and capture all of them in this database. And what we found as we analyzed the data across many different uh, parts of the world, and there are just examples of these in the colored lines that you see in the graph on the right, is that we found that these 51 features of social complexity, or clusters of features, move together. But we also found that social complexity rises sharply at very different points in world history. Now, our big question, of course, from the viewpoint of the theories that I've been talking about and the story about the Kivung, is we wanted to know when do the first really high-frequency doctrinal rituals appear? And also, when do the first shared moral systems that unite large populations come into being? Increasingly, the picture that is emerging from our analyses of this database suggests that doctrinal rituals occur here, at the very beginnings of the rise of social complexity, and appear to be part of the driving force behind the rise of and enlargement of the first really big uh, collective brains. Moralizing religions, on the other hand, appear to occur a lot later, roughly around the time that societies achieve the one million mark in terms of social scale. One of the reasons we think this is happening is because at this point in the rise of social complexity, societies are turning into multi-ethnic empires as a result of expansion and invasion. And Simply sharing a set of rituals is not enough to bind them together and to ensure that they operate successfully on that kind of scale. So really big societies seem to need a shared moral system as well. Okay, so we now live in a world where we have uh, both huge societies and religious traditions, world religions, bound together by these sorts of doctrinal practices. And we also have lots of examples of persisting imagistic practices. If you want to see some really vivid illustrations of the things I'm talking about, check out this BBC material, uh, which you can find online if you click on the BBC website and type in Extraordinary Rituals. This is something we've spent several years making, and there's some lovely clips illustrating the many points that I've been making. The great thing about looking at contemporary groups is that we can actually go and interview people, and we can run experiments and conduct surveys and do other kinds of empirical studies. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the psychological research that we've been doing into these topics. Let me begin with just a very, very quick overview of some fundamentals uh, from social psychology. Social identity theorists have long known that all of us have two kinds of identities. We have personal identities, qualities, that make us distinctive and unique as individuals. 
but we also all have group identities, qualities that align us with social groups. And most people, most of the time, see their personal and social identities as pretty separate. So that means that if you identify strongly with a group and somebody makes that group salient for you, it sort of eclipses and gobbles up, in a way, your personal identity, making it less accessible. Psychologists often refer to this as the kind of hydraulic relationship between personal and group identity. And what it means is that identifying with a group is pretty depersonalizing. But there's another kind of group alignment that we call fusion, which involves a visceral sense of oneness with the group. This is what early measures of fusion looked like, developed by Bill Swan and his lab at the University of Texas. We'd show people two circles. Small circle, that's you. Big circle, that's your group. And we'd invite people to say which of these representations best characterizes your relationship to the group. And people who chose the one on the right, we'd say, are fused with that group. Now, the thing about fusion is that it involves a kind of synergistic relationship between your personal and your social identity. It's a kind of union of both. So if you make the group identity of a fused person salient, it still taps into personal agency, and vice versa. You make their personal identity salient, and their group identity remains very accessible. What that means is if you're fused with a group and it comes under attack, it really feels personal. And it means that you, as a fused individual, will stop at nothing to protect your group and defend it against all comers. We know this because a lot of the early research used something that we call the fight and die measure, which uh, was essentially a measure of how willing people are to lay down their lives to protect and defend their groups. If you're highly fused, you would also score high on this fight and die scale. But a weakness, a limitation of this scale is that it was hypothetical. We didn't know whether people were just saying that they would do these extreme things. We wanted to see really whether they would follow that up behaviorally. So we needed to find a place where people actually were putting their lives on the line for each other. So we went here to Libya during 2011, during the uh, Arab uprising. And there we found huge numbers of people who were willing to lay down their lives for each other. This is an impromptu memorial to the dead that was erected in uh, the heart of Misrata during the uh, 2011 uprising. Wall upon wall, we're only seeing part of it here, of young men and boys who laid down their lives in that revolution. This is a once thriving marketplace in the heart of Misrata where Gaddafi's troops uh, like to sort of hide their tanks, in this case, ineffectually from NATO airstrikes. So we interviewed a large number of fighters in the various battalions or katibas that prosecuted the revolution. Our sample of revolutionaries was divided into two kinds. Frontline fighters, the people who experienced the worst horrors of the combat, and providers of logistical support to the frontline fighters. So these were people who drove ambulances and fixed vehicles and that kind of thing. And we asked them about fusion levels using the pictorial scale with various groups. So we asked them about fusion with family, fusion with fellow fighters in their uh, unit or battalion or katiba. Uh, we asked them about members of other battalions they didn't know personally but who fought bravely in the revolution. And we asked them about people who supported the revolution but didn't actually join the fighting units. Here's what we found. Ceiling levels of fusion with multiple groups, with family, with fellow fighters in your katiba, with fighters from other katibas. But look, floor levels of fusion with people who are on the same side ideologically but didn't have that common experience of being in the battalions. Okay, we said to people, we get that you're fused with multiple groups. But if you had to choose one of them, which would it be? And here we found a striking difference between the frontline fighters and the providers of lo logistical support. If you were a frontline fighter, you were far more likely to choose as your number one fusion target those people who fought with you in, on the front lines. Whereas if you were a provider of logistical support, you're more likely to choose your family. Now, our preferred explanation for this is that the experience of frontline combat was very much like these very intense rituals of the Mali that I mentioned at the beginning. 
they were very intense emotionally. They transformed the personal self and they bonded people together in a quite unique fashion. And this is something that we have confirmed over and over with studies with other military groups and with people engaging in intense rituals of all kinds. Okay, so all of this has been very interesting theoretically and, and scientifically, etc. But does it have any practical relevance? Can we do anything useful with all of this? Well, one thing that we should consider, I think, is what all of this means for dealing with violent extremism. It's all very well for our elite forces to bond through hazing rituals and other intense things like boot camp and what have you, because this is an authorized group, right? And we might even be reasonably happy for certain uh, elite schools and things like that to allow these sorts of practices to persist. But do we want imagistic practices to persist in, 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 in illegal groups like terrorist organizations, street gangs, and organizations of that kind? If we don't, how are we going to stop it? How can we defuse or de-radicalize, or whatever terminology you want to use, people in that position? Well, one set of ideas that we're developing focuses on the autobiographical memories that lie at the heart of the fusion process. It's the transformative personal experiences, after all, that make you fuse with the group in the first place. So focusing on those memories is one key, we think, into defusing violent uh, or, or members of, of violent extremist groups. Also, the assumption of shared experience is a vulnerable area. Both of these things could be tackled without addressing directly the extremist beliefs. So we think this is a potentially important area. What about not so much defusing individuals, but rechanneling it? Can we take fusion and direct it in more positive ways? We know that many football fans, for example, are highly fused with their football teams. Uh, one of my postdocs pictured on the right, Martha Newson, has been spearheading a whole series of really fascinating projects with football fans in Brazil, in the UK, in Indonesia, and in various other countries, Australia too, actually, where we have shown that fusion in football drives people very strongly into pro-social action. Now, not all of that is nice. It can express itself in the form of hooliganism and other violent behaviors. But David Dean, the former vice chairman of Arsenal Football Club and the Football Association in the UK, um, is setting up a project, he's pictured here in the middle, uh, which he calls the twinning project, where he twins prisons with their local football clubs and tries to harness what we call the fusion of football fans uh, in such a way as to commit them to mainstream law-abiding values and values to do with the healthiness and, and, and other positive features associated with football with the goal of reducing recidivism. And we're helping him to pursue this by uh, introducing measures and longitudinal studies to show how it works. Another way we can harness fusion in a positive way is to address global problems like climate change. We know that seven billion people around the world align themselves with religious groups. Many of them are actually fused with those religious groups or certainly have high levels of commitment. And we also know that most of those religious groups provide scriptural support for stewardship of the planet, even if they're not foregrounding that commitment, it's part of the traditions. So it's possible, perhaps, to harness the fusion of religious uh, uh, adherents so as to do things like the Sikhs are currently doing, trying to plant a million trees to celebrate the 550th birthday of their founder. Let me uh, end by asking this question. Are we really making the most of the collective brain to achieve peaceful, uh, outcomes in the world. We know that human beings are naturally super cooperators. I think this is beautifully expressed in Joe Henrik's talk at the beginning of the conference, but it has a dark side to it. Cooperation can be used to build industries that are damaging to us, that pollute the planet, that deplete resources, uh, or are destructive in other ways through warfare. But cooperation can also be used to make the world more peaceful and prosperous. So the question is, how can we achieve the latter and reduce the former? Well, one starting point I think we really need to consider 
is whether there are any moral principles or moral rules that all of us could agree upon all over the planet. Well, to explore whether that might even be a possibility, we took a sample of 60 cultures from around the world, which you can see represented on this map, that were selected to maximize diversity in the sample. And we looked to see whether there were any fundamental rules or principles that everybody could agree on. 60 societies, lots of sources of information on their moral judgments, a lot of text to analyze, and these are the results. It turns out there is a set of moral principles we all agree on worldwide. Here they are. Help your group, something we spent quite a lot of time talking about, or be loyal to your group. Help your family. Everyone agrees this is good. Return favors, reciprocate gifts or, 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 uh, or favors. Be brave, defer to superiors, show respect for authority. Divide resources fairly, just be fair, right? Respect other people's property. These seven principles are agreed upon. There's consensus about this all around the world. And interestingly, our, in our sample, none of those 60 cultures uh, regarded any of these things as morally bad. So the question is, can we harness things like that to address global problems? Well, here's a few thoughts about how we could apply that to the problem of conservation on a global basis. We could, we've already discussed this, perhaps harness our loyalty to group uh, by using the fusion of religion to address climate change. These are just examples. We could uh, emphasize the loyalty and commitment to family by emphasizing how uh, tackling climate change is caring for our children and our grandchildren. We could emphasize the theme of heroism by strengthening commitment to a war against climate change. What about deference? What about respect for religious leaders and their teachings, especially on the question of stewardship of the planet? What about the issue of fairness? After all, we have to share the, the earth, don't we, with millions of other species. What about the issue of property? Humans just evolved recently, of course. Other species have prior claims to the earth. These are all issues that we could be focusing on, and the question is, how well are we actually doing at applying those moral arguments? Well, to find out, we analyzed a whole load of scientific uh, texts combing through the academic literature on the theme of cooperative conservation, and we managed to find 910 citations relating to that topic in the literature, and here's how they bunch up. More than 85% of all of those were references to the issue of reciprocity, practically overlooking all the other possibilities. What this means is that we're massively underexploiting an opportunity here. We really need to work harder, I think, to harness our cooperative instincts and to build a more fully functional collective brain, a brain that values peace and prosperity over conflict and violence. So let me end with that cautiously optimistic note and thank all of you for listening and my collaborators.